lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you, Lord, especially this time of year as many people revisit these wonderful truths of our salvation with the cross and the empty tomb. Thank you, Lord, that uh, any time of year, it's always appropriate to rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done. But this time of year, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, as we approach this uh, celebration of your resurrection, would give us a deeper understanding, a richer way of looking at these things and a deeper work in our hearts and lives. Lord, bless your word. Bless all who hear your word this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As I've been praying about just this whole time of the year, I've actually been praying about it since before Christmas, and uh, I'll start praying about next Christmas, probably before the end of August, and just where to go and how God wants to direct. Um, there's a theme that that has just really stood out to me from the Bible. And that theme is beholding Jesus and really just beholding what he has done for us. And as I was looking at this, I started to realize that that word behold is, is used a lot in this whole narrative. And behold means, you know, look and look again. Th this look, because this is most unusual. It's like, don't miss this. Observe this in awe and reverence and wonder. That's sort of what behold means. And as we think about, you know, behold is something that's just so out of the usual, something that's so out of the ordinary, something that is extraordinary that we don't want to miss. And so there's this word behold that is used in, uh, throughout this whole thing. Today we're going to be looking at a, a verse in Hebrews that says, Behold, in the volume of the book it is written of me, I come to do your will. And we're going to be looking at the things leading up to uh, Palm Sunday and leading up to Good Friday, leading up to Easter Sunday. On Good uh, next Sunday we're going to be looking at Behold, your King is coming to you. And that, of course, is part of the Palm Sunday narrative. On Good Friday, we're going to be looking at Behold the Man. Look and look again in awe and reverence and wonder because something unusual is happening here. And then Easter Sunday, Behold, I am alive forevermore. Look in awe and wonder. He's alive forevermore. So this whole theme of beholding Jesus and drawing close to him, we're going to be beginning in, in this little series of four messages here this morning. And behold, in the volume of the book, it is written of me, uh, I come to do your will, O God. And basically what that is saying, we're going to be uh, looking at this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. Then I said, behold, I have come, and I'm reading exactly the, what I was quoting, referencing before. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. And what it's really referencing is that Leading up to this time of, this series of events that we remember this time of year, this crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead, in the volume of the book, in the entirety of the Bible leading up to this, of course there were many reasons that the Bible was given, but one primary reason was to prepare the world for the coming of the Savior, the coming of Jesus Christ. And in the whole of the Bible leading up to this series of events that we remember from Palm Sunday through Easter Sunday, it was written that Christ would come to do God's will. And so we're going to be thinking about that. There were something like 330 prophecies over, given over thousands of years about what would happen when Jesus came, when the Christ would come. And mathematically, if there had only been 50 prophecies instead of over 300 prophecies, of course there were over 300, but if there had only been 50 prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Christ, spoken before he was born, with none of them not being fulfilled, and then you add in there the mix of the time that he would be born and the place that he would be born, Mathematics cannot express 
the probability that that could be done by accident. It's not even possible with 50 prophecies to express the impossibility that that could take place by accident. But of course, there were a lot more than 50 prophecies. There were over 300 prophecies written in the Old Testament about what Christ would do when he came. How many of you know you can tell what's important to somebody by what they talk about? And what's important to God is what he talks about. And he did not stop talking about when his son would come to take away our sin and make us right with him. God, he, he just kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it because it's important to him and it's also vitally important to us. Many of these prophecies were of such a nature that only God could fulfill them. Who else could fulfill a virgin birth? Only God could cause that to happen supernaturally. Who else could cause someone who died to be resurrected from the dead? That wasn't even, it's not even humanly possible for these things to take place apart from the person of God at work in them and behind them. And so for us who believe in Jesus Christ and have experienced this salvation, this amazing gift that God has given us, there, there are four great truths that this has to uh, resonate within our hearts and lives. And one great truth is this. The Bible is God's inspired word. If you want to know what is truth, those fulfilled prophecies tell you this book is truth. People are not capable of writing or fulfilling such a literary miracle as the prophecies that were fulfilled in the person of Christ. It is not humanly possible for people to write about them. It is not humanly possible for people to fulfill them. It is a sovereign act of God, and it verifies that Jesus Christ is exactly who the Bible says he is. So it proves that the Bible is the inspired word of God. It proves that the God of the Bible, the only one who knows the end from the beginning, who alone has the power to fill his word, is the only true and living God. There is no God apart from the God of this book because that's his clear statement that he makes within this book. You're wondering what approach to God is right. These prophecies that, that came uh, about in the person of Jesus are categoric proof that the God of the Bible is the only true and living God who, who causes his will to take place among people. It proves that the God of the Bible is all-knowing and all-powerful, that he's able to know the future and to bring it to pass in the middle of, a, of, a, of a, a race of people who are set against his will. Not everyone wanted God's plan to come to pass. Herod tried to, Pilate tried, you know, so many people tried to stop Jesus from, from doing what he said that he was going to do, but they could not. And so God is able to bring his purposes to pass even when people are set against them happening. Isn't that good to know? I'm really happy to know that. How about you? N not everybody wants to see God's purposes come about in this world. But it proves that the God of the Bible is both all-knowing and all-powerful. It proves that Jesus, this is the fourth thing, who perfectly completed and fulfilled all these prophecies about him, is indeed the Messiah, is indeed the Savior of the world. It's categoric proof. And he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Aren't you glad that he shined his light into your life? I'm so thankful. So these prophecies, behold, in the volume of the book it is written, I come, O God, to do your will. Acts chapter 3, verse 24 says this, And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. These days meaning the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, the ascension of Christ, who that had just happened right there before the book of 
Acts. I love on the road to Emmaus when Jesus appeared to people after his resurrection and they, you know, they didn't know that he was alive at this point. And they're telling him all, he says, why are you troubled? Yeah, there's certain humor in this. You know, here's these disciples walking along the road. Jesus appears to them. They don't know it's him. He says, why are you troubled? And they said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about this? I mean, they're talking to him. You know, are you the only one who hasn't heard? What? We thought Jesus was the, the promised one, and, and he was crucified. And, and, oh, it's just a terrible thing that had happened. And he says to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in the scripture. And, you know, that gives us a little perspective on our lives. You know, what we think is out of control is actually in control. We look at things, we think this is completely out of control. It may be completely out of our control. That may be true. But how many of you know it's not out of his control? He's bigger than we are. He understands everything. We only understand what's right in front of our eyes. But he understands it all. And aren't you thankful that that even in the times when it just looks like things have gone so bad and things are out of control, it's still in his control. And he still knows the plans he has for us, as Charlene reminded us earlier. He knows the future that he has written in, our, in his book for our lives. There's times in our lives that where it looks like that future looks like it's going to be massively derailed. And if it is, it just means it wasn't his future, <laughs> right? But his good plan shall prosper. And aren't you thankful that it shall? You know, there's a certain wonder about these things that we cannot afford to lose. We can't afford to take for granted the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. It needs to, we need to behold this, to, to look at it again in awe and wonder, and to realize, you know, even though we live our lives relying on his crucifixion and his resurrection on a daily basis, a daily basis, we rely upon that, we can't lose the, the, the wonder of it all, the amazement of it all, and we have to come back and behold Jesus. It says in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. You know, even the people who prophesied these things, they, they weren't sure what it was. They made careful searches to try to find out what it was that they were talking about. And it was revealed to them, the Bible says, in verse 12, that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So angels have a sense of awe and wonder about this. The God who never was created took on humanity and lived among us. They have a wonder about that. They have an awe about that. Do we have an awe about it? The prophets who prophesied about these things, it wasn't just one and done. They prophesied and then they, they did searching and inquiries to seek what it meant. And, you know, we need to, to continue to seek God in our own lives for what these things mean to us. God doesn't want to bless your plan for your life. He wants you to be in line with his plan for your life. Because he has one. Isn't that good news? He has a plan. So this word behold, just to in awe and wonder. Behold, in the volume of the book it is written. And behold, my remote isn't working. <laughs> well, it's all right. 
So, do you know, even in his incarnation, as it was prophesied, Isaiah chapter 7, 14 says this, Behold, a virgin will be with child. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before Christ was born, this was written, at least. The Lord himself will give you a sign. What a sign! Only God could give that sign. And it says, behold, look and look again. Look in awe and wonder that God is going to bring his son into the world by causing a virgin to conceive and to bear a son. And she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. This one who was be born would be unlike any other birth in, in the entirety of human history. He would not have a human father. He would have a stepfather who raised him, but he would not have a human father. Look and look again in awe and wonder. And you know, many years later, hundreds of years later, how many of you know, when God doesn't do what we think he's telling us in 15 minutes, we wonder if it, God was that you, you know? <laughs> We're talking 700 years here, you know? And these things were written in public documents that anyone can look at and compare. They're not hidden away where only the select few can read about them, like some groups have. Public documents. It was out there. And a young man named Joseph was engaged, betrothed, to a young woman named Mary. And she had this crazy story as to why she was expectant that an angel had appeared to her and said that her son that she would conceive in her womb without a human father would be the son of God. And he decides, this is too much for me. I'm going to separate myself from her. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Look in awe and look in amazement. God protecting his plan. How many of you know God's ways do not make sense to our natural mind all the time? Have you found that out yet? They, they just don't. Sometimes when, when we've been needing money and we've prayed about it, the Lord has told Charlene and me to give money away. How many of you know that does not make sense to your natural mind? God's ways aren't always our ways. And it's always worked out when we've obeyed the Lord and followed him and, and done the things that he has asked us to do. So Joseph, he took Mary as his wife. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. Some shepherds were out in a field, watching over their flock by night. And suddenly, the entire sky was illuminated with a chaotic jumble of angels. How many of you know that would get your attention? <laughs> That'd get my attention, I'll tell you that. The entire sky is illuminated with this chaotic jumble of angels. And that's pretty much what the word means. I, I, I've never, I don't know much about, I mean, I know what the Bible teaches about angels, but I'm, I'm not the kind of guy who's ever had an angel visibly come to me and, Sometimes I have sensed angels present, but I, I've never like sat and talked with an angel like in his chair or anything like that. I don't know, maybe you have, I haven't. But my impression of angels is that they're very disciplined and they're very regimented and they're very orderly. But when Jesus was born, it was just like they all said, 
we got to see. And they, this jumble of angels is filling the sky. And guess what? The angel said to the shepherd, Luke chapter 2, 10 and 11, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, look and look again, consider and awe and reverence and wonder. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. How many of you know that includes you? That includes me. All the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. And that's why Jesus came ultimately to save us from our sins. Mankind lost their way. We're like a train that's gone off the tracks. The wheels are spinning. People got disconnected from God due to the sin that's within our lives. We've been rebellious against God, against our Heavenly Father. And we've done things that have offended Him. But He didn't leave us there. Aren't you thankful? Behold that. He didn't leave us there. He, you know, he, he provided a way that our sins could be forgiven. The penalty paid. And everyone in this room has great reason to be rejoicing and to be thankful for that. Because without Jesus, without the forgiveness of sins that we find in him, there's only one ultimate destiny for each of us, and that's eternity in hell. But because of Christ, he took our place. And it's like, look in awe, look in wonder. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Aren't you thankful? Many years would go by. Jesus is now some 30 years old. He's ready to begin his public ministry. Three years that changed the life of, of billions. Three years public ministry. I've been in public ministry for 40 years. I sure haven't changed. Hi, this is Pastor lives. Dan Kramer from Zion <laughs> Christian Church Three in Pittsburgh. Years he was. This program will he give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing did. God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and John the ministry Baptist. of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some John Sunday Baptist morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love 29. to make you welcome, the next and I know the Holy Spirit Jesus would encourage to him you. And said, we take time in His presence to enjoy God. Him. We'd love to have you do it that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Look, look again, because this is the one who's going to bring forgiveness to the world. Look at him. Behold him. And I want to tell you, whatever your problem are, whatever, whatever your issues are, whatever is going on in your life, whatever distresses you may have, whatever regrets you may have, wh whatever, you know, whatever challenges to your faith you may have, look at Jesus. Look at him. Look at him. And get the faith and the courage that you need to trust God with those things, that there's a bigger picture than you know and understand, and, and he has you in his hands. Look at Jesus. And when you look at Jesus, you get peace back in your heart. Lord, I am in your hands. My problems are in your hands. I don't really understand why things have gone the way that they have. But God, I'm confident that you understand. And I'm confident that in your bigger picture, I, I'm, I'm right in line with where I need to be for you to get me where you need to get me. Look at Jesus. And John the Baptist pointed him out uh, of all the people that were coming to be baptized. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How many of you remember the, the first time you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? How light you felt. Oh, my goodness. To know that we're clean and free and forgiven. I, I recently had a, just a, a thrilling testimony from one of our refugee teenagers 
who did not grow up in a Christian climate. And they came to me and they said, I'm now Jesus' daughter, and I've made a clean place for him in my heart. Wow. <laughs> wow. Remember that clean place, what that's like? When you know that you've been washed and forgiven. Remember that. Remember how fresh it is to have that encounter with Jesus. And John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We need to behold him. We need to behold him. There's a lot more that I could draw attention to, but I do want to bring us to take communion this morning. So I'm going to ask the team to come back up to the front. Throughout the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, he never sinned. He never did anything wrong. He loved. He healed. He delivered. He restored. He rebuilt. But I have one more behold to look at here. And it comes towards the end of his three years, three and a half years of ministry, where he took the 12 aside, Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34. He took the 12 aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon and after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things. And the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. They did not comprehend the things that were said. Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The primary reason that he came, he was about to accomplish to die for our sins. He knew exactly everything that lay before him. He knew exactly what would happen. And he embraced it to forgive us. You know, what love? I mean, it is amazing grace. You know, we sang that amazing grace this morning. How sweet the sound. It is absolutely amazing. None of us want to die for our enemies. But at the time that Christ died, we were his enemy because of our sins. I'm pretty sure if I was to study in West Point, which I never have, but I'm pretty sure if I would, they wouldn't teach as a great battle strategy, die for your enemy. <laughs> you think that's pretty safe to say? No, they wouldn't. Uh, in the natural realm, and certainly in the human realm, that makes no sense as far as war is concerned. But in the spiritual realm, that's exactly what he did. He died for us. He took our place. My friend uh, who I used to do evangelism with in England, his name was Philip Bragg, he used to tell a story where He'd say, salvation is kind of like this. Let's say you were on trial for a crime that you did commit. And the, the sentence for your crime was death. And as you're awaiting the verdict, the death penalty, which you deserved, the judge rose and said, if you're willing, I will take your place and you can go free. He said, that is what Christianity is. The judge taking the place of the guilty, that the guilty could go free, redeemed and changed and forgiven. That is amazing. And that's what he did for us. Why did he do it? 
because he loves us. With all of our failures, with all of our mistakes, with all of the things we get wrong, with all of our sins, with all of our weaknesses, with all of our limitations, the God of the universe loves us and sent his only son to die in our place. I'm going to ask Ed to... Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Thank you.